Good having you back with us. Today we're covering Isaiah chapter 37 as we're getting a little past the halfway point of Isaiah. Uh, we're going to talk about God listens today and we're going to be talking about King Hezekiah and a prayer that he gives and makes toward God when he had troubled times around him. So uh, with, a, with that in mind, just one, make sure you have a Bible. Make sure you have something to write with, something to write on. If you need a pause, go grab that, come back. We'll be here, ready to get started when you come back, okay? Why don't you share about a time or think about a time when you needed someone else to help you? Think of some time in your life when you needed help and assistance from someone else. What made you turn to that person for help? Why did you pick that person? And what were the circumstances that, that made you turn to someone else? And as you think about that, maybe as you jot that down, just a couple of things. Uh, you know, mo most people are familiar with the saying, if you want something done, do it yourself. I've always heard it said, if you want some, something done right, do it yourself. Um, but that kind of comes with the statement of that someone has let us down in the past, right? We've tried to delegate it. We've tried to give it up to someone else and they just didn't do it to our satisfactory. Um, we think so that, so what we do is we take matters in our own hand. We sit back and say, you know what? I'm just going to do it myself because it's easier, easier for me to do it than it is for me to train them to do it the right way. It's easier for me to do it than get someone else to do it. And then I got to come back and, and fix the mess that they made, right? Because it wasn't done right. So uh, here, here in this context, though, when we start talking about how many times do we try to take things away out of, not out of other person's hand, but we try to take out of God's control, out of God's hand, right? Do we need to recognize our inadequacies in order to turn to God in prayer? Okay, do we need to not, maybe not take it away from God? You know, we don't sit there and say, hey God, I need to take this back because you're just not doing it in my time. You're not doing it the way I want it done. Do we need to recognize our inadequacies in order to turn to God in prayer? Uh, would you consider this a weakness? And if so, or if not, why or why not would you consider that a weakness? So just pause and think on that for a second. I think our mindset a lot of times comes to that we just need to do things ourselves. And uh, I've heard it said many times that people would quote the Bible as you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And I'm like, first off, that's not in the Bible. Matter of fact, that's anti-Bible because the Bible says trust in God, not trust in yourself. And uh, so, so when we talk about us turning to God in prayer, the world a lot of times looks to, to, looks to us as that's a sign of weakness. But we should know as believers that is a sign of strength that we are turning to the creator of this world, the creator of you and me, the one that's in control of all things, and asking for help should be a sign of strength, not of weakness, even though the world around us realizes that is our that that doesn't realize that it's our strength okay so we need to be seeking god's help and understand that seeking god's help is a sign of wisdom so when we look at this context when we talk about uh, isaiah chapter 37 you need to understand that isaiah 36 through 39 serves as a historical bridge transitioning from the first section of isaiah to the last section of isaiah and uh, Isaiah turns his attention to three events in the life of King Hezekiah. And they're recorded also in 2 Kings chapter 18 through 20. But when Isaiah writes them, it's not in a chronological order as it is necessarily in 2 Kings. But the three things that take place, the three, three things that happen is first, there's a miraculous defeat of the Assyrians who invaded Judah and laid siege on Jerusalem. That's Isaiah 36 through 37. Secondly, Hezekiah's life-threatening illness, his plea for God's healing, and God promises to add 15 years to his life. That's in Isaiah 38. Uh, and then thirdly, Hezekiah's prideful act of showing the treasures of Jerusalem to an envoy presented, representing the king of Babylon uh, in Isaiah 39. These events, like I said, are not necessarily in chronological order, but they serve to show that even the most godly people, such as Hezekiah, Felt in their commitment to the Lord in spite of God's goodness to them. And the Lord dispenses of the Assyrian threat, but the Babylonian exile would not be a place of escape from Hezekiah and for Judah because of their actions. Because in one scenario, he turns to God. In another scenario, he turns to himself to brag about what has been accomplished. 
All right. So as we get started, as we look to this, we need to understand that turning to God is a sign of wisdom in our life and not something that we brag about. It's something that we brag about what God has done in our life as we move on. Okay. So as we study Hezekiah's prayer uh, in Isaiah 37, uh, consider the role prayer currently has in your own life. Okay. So let's look at uh, chapter 37 of Isaiah, verse 14 through 20. And uh, look for Hezekiah's motivation in this prayer. Um, now, two big names in this before I get started. Hezekiah, which I've already mentioned several times. The other one is Sennacherib. And I say Sennacherib. And since I'm leading the lesson, what I say is how it's going to be pronounced. That's the rule of class, right? The first person to pronounce it, the rest of the class must follow. But that's how I say it. So that is the king of Assyria at the time, okay? Sennacherib. So let's dive in with that little nugget in mind. <laughs> All right. Hey, Hezekiah took the letter from the messenger's hands, read it, and then went up to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord of armies, Lord of hosts, God of Israel, and thrown between the cherub, cherubim. You are God, you alone, all the kingdoms of the earth. You made the heavens and the earth. Listen closely, Lord, and hear, oh, hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see, hear all the words that Sennacherib have sent to mock the living God. Lord, it is true that the kings of Assyria have devastated all these countries in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but made from wood and stone by human hands. So they have destroyed them. Now, Lord, our God, save us from his power, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are God, you alone. So when we read out what's happening here in this context, Hezekiah's motivation is, is that Assyrians, a big army, it has provided devastation to every country that it went up against. And here's this little country of Judah. And, and his motivation is, is just Hezekiah sits there and says, God, I cannot do this. I'm going to be wiped out. Our country is going to be wiped out. Judah will be wiped out. So what does he do? He takes this and he spreads it out in the Lord's temple. He lays it before the Lord. This and said, look, this is the claim that Sennacherib has sent. This is what he's going to do to us if we don't surrender. Now, I assume that Hezekiah is kneeling before God and he lays this at the feet of God in the temple and says, God, what are you going to do about this? Because of my ability, there is nothing that can be done. So Hezekiah finds the right posture, goes before God and says, God, open your ears and hear what I'm reading to you. God, open your eyes and see what's before you. This is your people. What are we going to do? And he brought that letter that contained this great arrogance from the Assyrian king and uh, positioned himself in, in, a form, in a position of humility before God. And in verse 15, when you look at it, Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Remember, all caps Lord means Yahweh, the name of God. And uh, he just sits there and he starts talking about everything that's going to be taking place. And he just appeals before God. Now, some of the irony that goes go ahead is that, uh, that Hezekiah realizes that God is in charge. God's in charge of all this. So if he wants the Assyrian army to take over Judah, the Assyrian army will take over Judah. But he also knows that if he wants Judah to win, God is in control even though this arrogant king of Assyria says, we're going to wipe you off the face of the earth, he says, Hezekiah comes back and says, that's only if God allows you. But this is your people, God. And what are you going to do to save us? All the other gods have been thrown and burned. But he comes before you, and you are God alone. So just kind of interesting as you go through. Hezekiah acknowledges that God was indeed in control of the situation. Hezekiah could not stand against the army of Assyria, but God could. Um, he's the one that made the heavens and the earth in verse 16. You made all of this. Assyria should be nothing for, for you, God. So what did Hezekiah's action in verse 14 and 15 reveal about God's character, about his character? And then what might keep a person from turning to God first? Why is it that we would sit there and not turn to God first. So when we look at Hezekiah's actions, we sit here and see a sign of humility from a king. God, there's nothing I can do on this, but I know who can do this, and that's you. 
So we see Hezekiah in a form of humility here. But what makes us not want to turn to God first? Too often times we think turning to God is a sign, like we mentioned earlier, a sign of weakness. But actually turning to God is probably the biggest, the, the biggest thing of strength that we have. Because we appeal to the creator of this world. The one that nations rise and fall at his whim, we appeal to him. So everything that we should do should be bringing it before God first and first in our life. And uh, how does the urgency of situations impact uh, who a person turns to for help? A lot of times when we find that that there is a is, is a impending issue, we got to take it. To, we either take it to God quick, or we act first without taking it to God and cause even bigger problems along the way. So. As we look through this prayer in 14 through 20, just look through and highlight the characteristics of who God is. What does Hezekiah use to help describe who God is in this context? As we learn about his character, pause that, do your highlights, write it down, come back, and then we'll kind of I'll kind of recap with you. All right. As I read through this, I look for God's characteristics. In 16, he says, "Lord of you are the Lord of armies. You know, you are the I am of the armies of the Lord of hosts. You're the God of Israel. So you're the Lord of all the armies, of all the armies of, of the earth. You know, we talk about the host of the armies. We talk about over everything, but even the, the angels, the spiritual armies as well. You're the God of, of Israel. You are God, you alone. You're Elohim, not just Yahweh, you're Elohim. Uh, you are God, you are alone over all the kingdoms of the earth. Why? Because you made the heavens and the earth. So you're God, you're the Lord of the armies, you're God of Israel, you are God alone, uh, you're the God that made everything. And then he comes back down, farther down and says, you're the Lord, our God, and you're a God who saves. You're a God who saves from his, saves us from his power. And you are God alone. He reemphasizes that again. You are God and you alone. It doesn't matter what, what Assyria thinks. It matters what reality is. And Assyria takes all these false gods and they throw them and they burn them. He said, those are false gods, but we worship the one true God. We don't, the, we don't worship the things that are made by man. We worship the thing that created man. And Sennacherib didn't realize that. He doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand that you are the creator and all those other gods that he thinks he's destroying and more powerful than has nothing on you, God. Nothing on you, Yahweh. You are the God. And that's how Hezekiah kind of prepares it and describes the characteristics of God. So let's look in at the next verses. Let's jump down to verse 30 uh, through 32. And as, as I read these two verses, listen for the indications of God's timing and answering Hezekiah's prayer. Verse 30, this will be a sign for you. This year you will eat what grows on its own, and in the second year what grows from that. But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For a remnant will go out from Jerusalem, and survivors from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. So when we look at this in context, the timing of what's going to take place with Hezekiah's prayer. Within three years' time, everything's going to be restored back, and, and Israel, uh, Judah, you're going to be thriving again. So you can't plant crops this year, and you're not going to be able to plant, plant crops next year, but in that third year, it'll be like Assyria was never here because they came and they lay siege to it. As they're laying siege, God's working it out, but he protects them in the process and everything will go back to normal. Now, the disruption of the, the planting and the harvest cycle, a lot of times means starvation for everybody, right? If you don't go out and you don't work the ground or you have a bad crop, it can mean your family starves for the next year, you know, or, or some starve, some survive, and, but it just means your whole family could be starving. But God said, don't worry, whatever the ground provides, you'll be able to eat. Whatever the ground provides next year, you'll be able to eat. But that third year, you'll be building your own crops and making them bigger and better than they ever have been. So, so we see God's promise that within that three-year time period, uh, Hezekiah's prayer will be answered. Um, and the sign promised to Hezekiah, verse 32, 
The remnant will go out and it says what? The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. He quotes Isaiah 9, 7. Same thing that he said to Ahaz uh, when he talked about things being accomplished. God comes back and quotes the same thing. The zeal of the Lord of the armies will accomplish this. Just as I've said it to King Ahaz, I will say it to you, King Hezekiah. The zeal of the Lord of the armies will accomplish this. You have my word, it will be done. Okay? So, um, but even more than that, just not that it will be done, but this context even comes back that it's not just going to get done now, but there's a greater restoration that will come later, as you'll see in the New Testament when Jesus comes along. All right? So as we continue on in the journey here, um, how does Hezekiah's situation compare with our situations when it comes to trusting God? How does his situation compare to our situations? And how important is expressing trust when praying to God? How does trusting in God's promises affect the mindset of the believer when praying? Now, I want you to pause and think about it. Uh, if you've been listening to sermons uh, on Sunday morning, we've been covering promises of God. Now, we're not covering them all. We're covering just a few of them. Uh, Pastor Tim has been teaching just a few of them. But think through some of the promises that we've been preaching. How much trust do you put in those promises? If God came and said, hey, don't worry, this is going to be a rough year, it's going to be a rough year, but don't worry, that third year, everything's going to be thriving. How much are you willing to trust in God in those first two years? And I bet even toward the end of that second year, it's going to get tough. But as you know, year three starts rolling in, you're like, this is where God's fulfilling his promise. He's been filling his promise this whole time. It's just you don't see the actions of it. You don't see the fruits of it as you move forward. So... How does trusting in God's promise affect the mindset of us as we pray? Do we trust in a God that fulfills his promises? Are we trusting God and hope that he fulfills his promises? There's a difference there, okay? So, um, let's keep going. Verse 33 through 35. And when I read through, uh, listen for why God answered Hezekiah's prayer, okay? Verse 33, therefore, now remember, when you see a therefore, you got to look in the context before to see what the therefore is there for. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city. Shoot an arrow here. Come before it with a shield or build up a siege ramp against it. He will go back the way he came and he will not enter this city. This is the Lord's declaration. I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Now, because of everything that he just promised and everything he just told Hezekiah in that third year, everything's going to be back to normal. And because of all this, because of the zeal of the Lord of the armies who will accomplish this, this is what's going to happen. Now, as he goes down and he starts looking through this, I mean, just think about the encouragement you get when God, the creator of the world, looks and says, don't worry about that king who looks way more powerful than your country. He will not enter this city. He will not shoot one arrow at it. He will not bring a shield. He will not even build up a siege ramp. He is not going to touch this city. Why? Because the zeal of the Lord of the armies will accomplish this. Now, why does he do that? <clears throat> I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake. Because, see, the king of Assyria comes up and says, I have conquered all these nations and lands because my God... My gods are bigger than their gods. And that's why he takes their idols and he throws them in the fire and burns them. But as, he as Hezekiah announces in his prayer, you're the creator of the world, Lord. You're our God and our God alone. We follow you. This is what he's done to all their gods, but they're man-made gods. So God comes back with a promise and says, I will do this for my sake because my character is in question here against the king of Assyria. And I will make sure that the Assyrian knows that I am the Lord and I am the one and only God. There are no other gods before me or near me. I will take care of this for my sake and because of the sake of my servant David as in the promise that he made to Judah who has turned, as their king has turned to them. Okay, so he has directly threatened God and he will be forced to recognize the power of God as he comes on to Judah. All right, so when we look at the character of God, when you call the question of the character of God into question, he stands up to defend his character. And it's not just because Hezekiah brought that before him. One is 
how Hezekiah brought it for him in a posture of humility, saying, this is an attack just against me. And it's not, what are you going to do for me, God? This is a, this is more about you, God, than it is about me. Hezekiah comes before him and says, this is your nation, God. This is what he wants to do to your nation that you've established. I'm bringing it before you to see how you'll respond because he's attacking who you are, God, not just me. Okay? So God doesn't always offer us a physical deliverance in times of every crisis, but believers can be assured that we have security of his presence in every situation. We may not get deliverance as Hezekiah gets here. We may not get a response in our prayer as the same response Hezekiah got, but it doesn't mean God is not on his throne. It doesn't mean that he's not walking with you. It doesn't mean that he's not trying to teach you and grow you to be more like him each and every time. So make sure you don't focus on the circumstances around you, but you focus on more of who he's trying to make you be in the midst of those circumstances. Okay? So as we wrap up, what situations have you hesitated to take to God in prayer recently? And take time to boldly approach him following Hezekiah's lead Record your thoughts after you've done so. So just look at the model of kind of how Hezekiah brought his request before God. So what are some things that you're reluctant to bring before God? Just humbly in the right posture, in the right manner. Go before God and lay your request before him. And you'll at least be able to have that conversation with God. I'm not saying everything, as I mentioned earlier, not everything he's going to, be, he's going to deliver you from. But everything there is definitely going to be a learning in the, in the middle of it. So what is it that God wants you to learn from that situation? And it may just be the simple act of taking it to him. Could be the first lesson. So don't hesitate bringing things before God. He created the world. You are way big. You don't have a question big enough that he can't answer and that he can't handle. You don't have emotional things that you can't bring before him that he can't handle. You don't have life circumstances that you can't bring before him that he can't deal with because he is your heavenly father and he will cry with you. He will walk with you. He will comfort you and he will encourage you in that time. So as we wrap up, let me just pause and let's pray for this lesson and thank God for who he is in his character. Okay. Dear God, I thank you that you're the creator of, over everything and nothing surprises you. And the things that we worry about in this world, Father, you're the creator of all things and you are in control of everything. Let us not sit back and worry about the enemies at our gates. But Father, let us come before you with all of our concerns and all of our issues and all of our problems. And Father, let us just trust in you and your character and the promises that you make and who you are. So that, Father, that we can trust in you more than the things around us. And we won't take that back and do it our own way. But we'll trust in your ways and all things. In your name we pray and ask it. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me today. I hope you've been blessed with this. If you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. Have a great day.